Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, wherever you're reading this, these are some musings of mine. I am Prashant Khanna. Uh, I'm a tutor at Wintech and uh, privacy in terms of COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, it's a personal take. Uh, I've been inspired to speak about this after having read you will know a Harari, uh, somebody who I follow. So I shall just be giving you my thoughts on where we stand in terms of the debate between whether we should be living in a free open society or we can uh, dispel our notions about privacy in the wake of an unprecedented emerging crisis that we are right in the midst of. Humankind is now facing a global crisis, perhaps the biggest crisis of our generation. The decisions people and governments take in the next few weeks will probably shape the world for years to come. They will shape not just our healthcare systems, but also our economy, politics, culture, and the way we live as humans. We must act quickly and decisively. We should also take into account the long-term consequences of our actions that we take today. When choosing between alternatives, we should ask ourselves not only how to overcome the immediate threat, but also what kind of a world we will inhabit once this crisis or storm passes. Yes, uh, the storm will pass. Humankind will survive. Most of us will still be alive. Most of us may still be as healthy as you would like it to be, but we will inhabit a different world. Many short-term emergency measures will become a fixture of life. That is the nature of emergencies. They fast forward historical processes, decisions that in normal times can take perhaps years of deliberation are passed in a matter of hours immature and even dangerous technologies are pressed into service because the risk of doing nothing are bigger. Entire countries may serve as guinea pigs in large scale social experiments. What happens when everybody works from home and communicates only at a distance? What happens when entire schools and universities go online? In normal times, governments, businesses and educational boards would never agree to conduct such experiments. But these are not normal times. In this time of crisis, we face two particularly important choices. The first is between a totalitarian surveillance and citizen empowerment. The second is between nationalist isolation and global solidarity. In order to stop the epidemic, entire population need to comply with certain guidelines. There are two main ways of achieving this. One method is the government to monitor people and punish those who break the rules. Today, for the first time in history, technology makes it possible to monitor everyone all the time. 50 years ago, the KGB from Russia, erstwhile Russia, couldn't follow 240 million Soviet citizens 24 hours a day, nor could the KGB hope to effectively process all the information gathered. The KGB relied on human agents and analysts, and it just couldn't place a human agent to follow every citizen. But now, governments can rely on ubiquitous sensors and powerful algorithms instead of flesh and blood spooks. In their battle against the coronavirus epidemic, several governments have already deployed the new surveillance tools. The most notable case is China. By closely monitoring people's smartphones, making use of hundreds of millions of face recognizing cameras, and obliging people to check and report their body temperatures and medical conditions, the Chinese authorities can not only quickly identify suspected coronavirus carriers, but also track their movement and identify anyone they came into contact with. A range of mobile apps warn citizens about their proximity to infected patients. This kind of technology is not limited to East Asia. 
Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel recently authorized the Israel Security Agency to deploy surveillance technologies normally reserved for battling terrorists to track coronavirus patients. When the relevant parliamentary subcommittee refused to authorize the measure, Netanyahu rammed it through with an emergency decree. You might argue that there is nothing new about all this. In recent years, both governments and corporations have been using even more sophisticated technologies to track, monitor, and manipulate people. Yet, if we are not careful, the epidemic might nevertheless mark an important watershed in the history of surveillance. Not only because it might normalize the deployment of mass surveillance tools in countries that have so far rejected them, say New Zealand, but even more so because it signifies a dramatic transition from over the skin to under the skin surveillance. Here too, when your finger touches the screen of your smartphone and clicks a link, the government wanted to know what exactly your finger was clicking on. We've discussed that several times in our class. But with coronavirus, the focus of interest shifts. Now the government wants to know the temperature of your finger and the blood pressure under its skin. One of the problems we face out where we stand on surveillance is that none of us know exactly how we are being surveyed and what the coming years might bring. Surveillance technology is developing at breakneck speed and what seems science fiction 10 years ago is today old news. As a thought experiment, consider a hypothetical government that demands that every citizen wears a biometric bracelet that monitors body temperature and heart rates 24 hours a day. The resulting data is hoarded and analyzed by government algorithms. The algorithm will know that you are sick even before you know it, and they will also know where you have been and who you have met. The chain of infection could be drastically shortened and even cut altogether. Such a system could arguably stop the epidemic in its tracks within days. Sounds wonderful, right? The downside is, of course, that this would give legitimacy to a terrifying new surveillance system. If you know, for example, that I clicked on a Fox News link rather than a CNN link that can teach you something about my political views and perhaps even my personality. But if you can monitor what happens to my body temperature, blood pressure and heart rates as I watch the video clip, you can learn what makes me laugh, what makes me cry and what makes me really, really angry. It is crucial to remember that anger, joy, boredom and love are biological phenomena that just like fever and cough. The same technology that identifies cough could also identify laughs. If corporations and governments start harvesting our biometric data en masse, they could get to know us far better than we know ourselves. And they can then not just predict our feelings, but also manipulate our feelings and sell us anything they want, be a product or a politician. You get the idea. Biometric monitoring would make Cambridge Analytica data hacking tactics look like something from the Stone Age. Imagine North Korea in 2030, when every citizen has to wear a biometric bracelet 24 hours a day. If you listen to a speech by the great leader and the bracelet picks up the telltale signs of anger, you are done for. You could, of course, make the case for biometric surveillance as a temporary measure taken during a state of emergency. It would go away, right, once the emergency is over. But temporary measures have a nasty habit of outlasting emergencies, especially as there is always a new emergency lurking on the horizon. Even when infections from coronavirus are over to zero or down to zero, some data-hungry government could argue they needed to keep the biometric surveillance systems in place because they fear a second wave of coronavirus or because 
there is a new Ebola strain evolving in Central Africa, or because you get the idea, right? A big battle has been raging in recent years over our privacy. The coronavirus crisis could be the battle's tipping point. For when people are given a choice between privacy and health, they will usually choose health. Asking people to choose between privacy and health is in fact the very root of the problem. Because this is a false choice, we can and should enjoy both privacy and health. We can choose to protect our health and stop the coronavirus epidemic by not instituting totalitarian surveillance regimes, but rather by empowering citizens. In recent weeks, some of the most successful efforts to contain the coronavirus epidemic were orchestrated by South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. As a matter of fact, New Zealand is kind of emulating the efforts that were done in these three countries. While these countries have made some use of tracking applications, they have relied far more on extensive testing, on honest reporting, and on the willing cooperation of a well-informed public. Centralized monitoring and harsh punishments aren't the only way to make people comply with beneficial guidelines. When people are told the scientific facts and when people trust public authorities to tell them these facts, citizens can do the right thing even without a big brother watching over their shoulder. A self-motivated and well-informed population is usually far more powerful and effective than a police ignorant population. At least that's my belief. Consider, for example, washing your hands with soap. This has been one of the greatest advances ever in human hygiene. This simple action saves millions of lives every year. And it, did not, it was not coronavirus that got this. While we take it for granted, it was only in the 19th century that scientists discovered the importance of washing hands with soap. Previously, even doctors and nurses proceeded from one surgical operation to the next without washing their hands. We would today call that as cross. Today, billions of people daily wash their hands, not because they're afraid of the soap or someone, uh, you know, checking over them, but rather because they understand the facts, the very facts. I wash my hands with soap because I have heard of viruses and bacteria. I understand that these tiny organisms cause diseases and I know that soap can remove them. But to achieve such a level of compliance and cooperation, you must trust. People need to trust science, to trust public authorities and to trust the media because they pass the information. Over the past few years, irresponsible politicians have deliberately undermined trust in science, in public authorities and in the media. Now, these same irresponsible politicians might be tempted to take the high road to authoritative, to proper authoritarian, arguing that you cannot trust the public to do the right thing. Well, we've seen that happen, haven't we? Normally, trust that has been eroded for years cannot be rebuilt overnight. But these are not normal times. In a moment of crisis, mind too can change pretty quickly. You can have bitter arguments with your siblings for years, but when some emergency occurs, you suddenly discover a hidden reservoir of trust and enmity, and you rush to help one another. Instead of building a surveillance regime, it is not late to rebuild people trust in science in public authorities and in the media. We should definitely make use of new technologies too, but these technologies should empower citizens. I'm in favor of monitoring my body temperature and body pressure, but that data should not be used to create an all-powerful government. Rather, that data could enable me to make more informed personal choices and also to hold governments accountable for its decisions. If I could track my own medical conditions 24 hours a day, I would learn not only whether I have a health hazard to other people, but also which habits contribute to my health. And if I could access and analyze reliable statistics on the spread of coronavirus, I would be able to judge whether the government is telling me the truth 
and whether it is adopting the right policies to combat the epidemic. Whenever people talk about surveillance, remember that the same surveillance technology can usually be used not only by governments to monitor individuals, but also individuals to monitor governments. The coronavirus epidemic is thus a major test of citizenship. In the days ahead, each one of us should choose to trust scientific data and healthcare experts over unfounded conspiracy theories and self-serving politicians. If we fail to make the right choice, we might fi find ourselves signing away our most precious freedom, thinking that this is the only way to safeguard our health.